Welcome. This is a November 30th Beehive call. We have Rod G, Andrew H, Jan B, Vitali G, John D, Hans R, Antonik V, and myself, Michael, so far. And if you have questions about the open ZFS issue that landed related to, uh, let's see, block cloning and was in 2.2, the call yesterday on open ZFS had Alexander Moten giving a great explanation backed up by Jan. So I've linked the document with notes and the recording in the show notes. And Rod, I believe you have a question to our Illumos users about their branch of ZFS. Yeah, I, I was wondering if Illumos is still maintaining ZFS of their own or if they're migrating and importing ZOL code or are just cherry picking stuff out of the ZOL repository. I don't have a very good picture of what's happening with ZFS and Illumos. Um, my understanding is that, yes, it's still separate, but the stuff that gets put into OpenZFS is also put into Illumos ZFS at roughly the same time. There's just not an effort to merge them. I'm not seeing that being done. Uh, oh, it's not at all? Well, sometimes some stuff is getting pulled into Illumos, but it's it's an awful lot of work. And unless there's a good reason to do it, if there's a feature people really want, uh, my impression is that nobody's really caring enough about it. Mm, I, thought, I thought they were tracking pretty closely. They just weren't yeah. merging. Every now and then, but not really closely. The only thing that we're tracking really closely is Beehive, as far as I know. This which? I'm sorry. Beehive. Ah, Beehive, yeah. Yeah, my impression also is that they're cherry picking. And in situations like what was recently discovered in 2.2, well, I suppose that policy is handy. Okay, uh, then Hans, any news? Did you have a chance to look at, say, time counters and other technologies that need some love? <laughs> I looked at getting my smarter build machine going again, um, okay. but not much further than that. I hope to look at the uh, time counter stuff over the weekend. Cool. And I'm going to get back to you. Excellent. And Vitaly, I know you would love to talk about Saber Store formats. Perhaps you can just catch us up to where every variation on that initiative is at. Yeah, uh, it would be nice to start it uh, if uh, we need some discussion, because I look at the meeting topics, uh, previous meeting topics, and uh, it was started with the TAR format. Uh, From the last call where we did indeed discuss this. Last, last, last. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, and call. that wasn't like firmly suggesting, but we explored different advantages and disadvantages, especially in the context of broad, much broader context of like OCI image handling, even though it's pretty orthogonal. So uh, what is your personal news on your development related to Save Restore and perhaps live migration? Yes, yeah, there, there is some issues with uh, uh, upstream Save Restore. I certainly I will create reviews for that. And one issue with the Beehive, it's not related to safe restore, it's related to rendezvous uh, function. Uh, rendezvous. Uh, it's a long term issue, several years. <laughs> and uh, that's uh, so it hangs, uh, and uh, VM can, cannot be destroyed at all. And uh, calling process hangs in kernel so it's uh, uh i will create probably review fixing review as well so, I, when you last joined us i believe you said you were updating your reviews have you made any updates you can share uh not yet but i'm uh i, I will uh, i will create uh, all of them at once okay. 
that would be great. And do you have, if it's from someone else, a, 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 an issue relating to the VMs that cannot be killed that you just mentioned? Uh, I didn't create that yet. I, I need to look through Bugzilla, something like that. So look, See if it's is there. it already created? You... Uh, or maybe uh, it just my uh, my unique set. No, uh, I'm uh, I, I'm at a new issue for that. So, so but I checked it yesterday. Uh, You're cutting out somewhat. And if there's a situation where VMs can't be killed, I'd be curious what circumstances you think that takes place under. That doesn't sound good. It's uh, related to uh, rendezvous, uh, rendezvous uh, function. It's uh, calls uh, thread sus sus check and uh, something related to that. Uh, 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 kills process uh, and without unwinding call, but uh, in uh, uh, upper call it function, uh, some resources, uh, uh, for example, VCPU is uh, is is good, and uh, but that process is is, is killed itself. Uh, itself and uh, that so in uh, the trace it looks like <laughs> uh, in kernel one function uh, vmem or ctl uh, calls another function and another function another function and uh, call trace and but it never unwinding uh, <laughs> and uh, go to user space well yeah, let us know what you find and definitely share that. Yeah, it's a uh, PR. I, when I, you have it. I, I, I never, uh, I've never seen that situation like that because I, for my experience, all uh, call stack and kernel should be uh, the quart uh, unwinding and uh, go to user space and uh, all functions should be. Uh, uh, any function that is called in user space uh, in the kernel should be uh, uh, return return it and uh, resources should be check it and free it. But yeah, <laughs> but it's uh, uh, pretty unique for me. <laughs> New knowledge. Yeah, uh, John or Jan, have you seen anything like that in the wild? Nope. And for what it's worth, is this on so, Intel or AMD? Have you debugged that to a point where you know which lock is being held or which thread is blocking? Ah, uh, I, I mean, uh, it it could be uh, memory can be unlocked or for uh, something music mutex can be held. So, but uh, for my situation, the CPU is. Uh, uh, it's changed its state, but uh, after uh, threat and process uh, is killed uh, it, it, itself, uh, the CPU, uh, because it uh, uh, nested function is never exited, uh, the CPU is uh, keep since uh, in state in usage state. So, any other questions for Vitali? And uh, so then, what architecture is that on? Despite them being the same, is it Intel or AMD? And what version of FreeBSD are you seeing that on? And the latest. Uh, actually, so you're on fourteen. Uh, uh, yeah. Well. Uh... 13.2 uh, and uh, the latest. Okay. And again, Intel or AMD hardware? Um, in, Intel, but I I think it doesn't matter because it's... Uh, right. Well, just probably not. 
Yeah. Well, keep us posted. That is definitely something to be concerned about. I, I don't. I will create a ticket for that. I, okay. And uh, put uh, the trace uh, stacks and uh, another information. Great. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Here to come. Let's see. Uh, Andrew, anything to share from the wilds on Illumos? No. Are you staying ahead of the uh, torrent of life and administration? <laughs> no. Oh, well, let us know how we can all help. I will be doing a lot of windows under Beehive shortly, so I'll, I'll share notes and thank you for, uh, yeah, is it uh, Gilbert's notes? So, uh, I know, Jan, you've been working on uh, safe inter network interface, renaming, etc. Have you made any progress since we last talked? And is there anything to demo on that? Or are you still just plugging away? There's nothing to demo. Um, I didn't have time since last night. Since last night. OK, cool. I had to work in between. I understand. But you were working on, uh, as I understand, item potent interface renaming. Is that an, an accurate way of describing it? Yeah, basically a little tool to do the same things which IF config does, plus uh, figure out if something either, depending on what to do, I either have to accept the race condition and then recover uh, if the operation partly succeeded uh, or pre-check if the operation has already been successful before. So for example, if I want to have a tap interface with a certain name, I check ahead of time if it exists. If not, I uh, try to, if it's possible, I try to directly create it. If it's not possible, I create the next free one and then try to rename it, but potentially there's a race condition there, but someone else may do the same thing. Let's say you have two different supervisors, as like, uh, I don't know, some kind of dev D and a cron job or something, trying to fix something up at the same time. Uh, or the user on the command line tries to restart a VM and dev D responds in the same moment. So then if I fail part way through, I have to uh, figure out if it is because someone else already did it for me and then I have to clean up the partial state and maybe emit a warning, but still succeed. Stuff like that. So that okay. I can say, this is the intended state I want to have or this tap interface should no longer exist. If it didn't exist beforehand, that's fine. If it exists and I can destroy it, that's fine too. If I can't destroy it for some reason, then maybe I'm not running with the right permissions, then that's an error. Okay. Stuff like that. If anyone has bumped into issues like that, particularly race conditions relating to IF config, reach out to Jan, please. So I have an ugly wrapper and shell, but that's too much of a mess that I don't want to maintain it. So instead I looked into doing it with a netlink because other than there's I octals, I hope there's a better oh, yes. forward compatibility. Uh, I buried the lead using netlink and I, uh, that's a new technology. Can you give the one sentence description of what it does? It solves the problem that I opt-outs have that they are good for occasional small records, but not for lots of small records, especially not for very big uh, state updates because an iOctal only can move a single object at a time. There's no built-in support for basically streaming. So if you want to, um, you basically have to pull repeatedly or, or build your own protocol on top of them. 
So let's say you want uh, all PF firewall states. With an IOCTL, you would have to uh, build up an array of all the states and then copy them over to user space. And if you have 10 million states and let's say 100 bytes per state, yeah, well, that's just a 100 megabyte uh, buffer you have to copy around in one system call. It's not fun. Uh, whereas Netlink uh, can, supports both streaming and uh, because it is already a type level value, um, type length value, sorry, uh, encoding, it inherently supports extensions by just adding a new type level uh, value encoding for a new type. Cool. Are there any questions for Jan relating to net length uh, and interface state changes? Mm -hmm. So Alexander Chernikov's uh, helper library, which is FreeBSD specific, makes parsing the variable length records a lot easier and less painful than I would have expected for C code. Um, it works by basically working the different levels of the nesting and then invoking callbacks. And you can give it a basically the across only once header at the beginning is invoked once per callback and then, or pass once per callback. And then you can basically have for each attribute, which can be a verbal number of, you can have it just um, dispatch on the type of the attribute and then invoke the correct callback and the callback gets the offset and a pointer to a a structure. And so basically you're then expected to um, cast the pointer and offset to the right type and copy the data out. So you, and because we're already helpers for the common types like fixed size integers and zero terminated C strings and so on, normally you only have to specify this is my structure, uh, this is the offset of the field in the structure and it should copy this type. Okay. And then if the message contains this type, uh, after what you have a non null pointer to a terminated string, which is uh, a lot easier than having to do it every time. It may not be as efficient as a handwritten parser in every case, but it's more than fast enough compared to the context switch. And yeah. Cool. You have posted a review from... Yes. Uh, authored by Mark J and reviewed by REW. What can you tell us about this? So... Um... This um, review, so which uh, I was surprised to see has been committed already uh, in the current form, um, basically adds lib, uh, lib support to Beehive, which allows running uh, network connected Beehive guests without uh, root uh, privileges, because basically it emulates in the tablet device to the instead of so instead of the tab device, it emulates the guest device and then uh, passes the packets and uses the host stack to basically do a nut in user space or in the Beehive process in this case, so that it will if you see an outgoing TCP connection, it will then uh, use a Beehive uh, process a socket to. Um, handle that connection. So it's really uh, not the most efficient way of doing things, but it is easy to allow rootless uh, guests. That was his use case. Root as in root user or? Root other? as in you, do, you don't need to be root on the host system to start or stop. Okay, but then what about creating the virtual machine itself? Yeah, for that you need permissions on the device so, so if you have a, you have to set up the permissions in the DevFS, but it looks like the rest, you don't have to be root anymore. At least that was the goal. Oh, Explain. interesting. Um, it, so if yeah. you have the permission to create the device in the uh, EMM directory, you can create a new uh, device. That's his use case. Probably uh, useful to restrict this to a dedicated group, but yeah. Or you could have a helper here, but yep. it's also used, for example, in Linux uh, for rootless containers. Yeah, 
No, that's fascinating. There you open a tap device, put the tap device into a network namespace, and then have the process doing the emulation, which now happens in a Beehive user space process. In that case, they keep it in an other namespace so that it can use the normal network. It's really uh, kind, uh, quite involved uh, okay. emulation because basically you have to run your network and I don't know how they do IPv6, but supposedly it is possible. Uh, I don't know which design they chose, if it requires more configuration or if they assume that you can use uh, the v 6 prefix delegation to get the prefix or they even uh, then totally uh, crazy and implemented a stateful NUT 6.6. I don't know what they're doing, but I just found it an interesting uh, development. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, at least in FreeBSD, you could also set up the system in such a way that you don't have to be root either maybe through the right kind of mandatory access control or through a uh, higher pass which respond on your behalf. Basically, if you ask for certain things, DevD will do it for you. But yeah, that's currently. Yeah, I, I had asked him about this maybe nine months ago and he said it would be quite involved but the whole notion of gradually removing the obstacles is quite cool thank you yep. for that and Antranig, did he answer your question about the equivalence to net user on qemu yeah as far as i understand it's basically the same idea and it does actually it also uses the those... same library oh yeah. sorry mm -hmm. Yeah, it does also get us closer to uh, non-root uh, beehives. Although, uh, uh, te technically, I mean, technically, we can now also have non-root beehive if everything is configured properly. Or yes. would the process? Yeah, yeah, right. Like a, a non-root user can run beehive as long as the VMM device and everything else is created for them in advance. Or they have the right uh, access permissions on a maybe dedicated device file system to change root into or something. Hmm. Yes, of course. Yes. So you could have that as well. If you don't want to apply uh, the right group permissions, you could instead have a dedicated uh, mount point to change root into. And that could that... in a device file system with different permissions. Does that mean that uh, we can change some defaults on free BSD, where like we can have a group called VMM and a proper permission in DevFS that any user in the uh, VMM group can just create a uh, VM device, and now we have uh, rootless Beehive. Be 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 uh, the beehive problem VMs. is to make it useful. You also have to access the network and storage. Uh -huh. So for okay. file-based access, that would be easy. So file. Raw disk image files are no harder than normal files. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. For def, uh, for Z vaults, you have to change again the permissions on the devices. Then you can read and write them. What I of don't course, but know that, if there okay. are any uh, mm -hmm. explicit privilege checks around uh, initializing the VMN device. It could be that there's a ah, safety net there. Or it could be I that see. because uh, the permission by default has always been to only enable uh, write access of the directory and the uh, device nodes to root that there is no extra uh, privilege check which would prevent you from letting mm -hmm. nobody uh, wire down 200 gigs of memory just for uh, shit and giggles. That, that does bring I me haven't to... looked at that. That does bring me to two questions. Can the Zvol issue be solved on the ZFS layer? Where like, you know, because ZFS does, uh, yeah, via delegation. Is that possible, Jan? I don't know. I, I don't think so. That's like for administrative procedures, but yeah, I guess it's a permissions issue. It is really a, the problem is you have to assign ownership to the device nodes. I don't know if that's preserved okay. because I Got didn't it. have a use case for that. Okay. And my second question would be, uh, uh, also on Linux, they solved it in a very Unixy way, uh, Unixy way back in the old days, where there's also a group called the Toontap. I think it got renamed to Tap lately, or Tune, or yes. one of those things, 
which allows the user to create a ToonTap interface with the proper permission. So, you know, on FreeBSD, we have, let's say, uh, pros, um, interface tab zero. The kernel is aware that tab zero is being used by process one, two, three, four. And it technically it also can be aware that it's, it belongs to, let's say, UID 1000. And we might also, you know, add the uh, basically two groups, one for VMM, one for tune tap and uh, or tap in our case. We don't we don't use tunes basically on FreeBSD and and have that problem solved of having rootless a beehive uh, or for the networking. Of course, this just assumes that like NAT is pre-configured for you. Although uh, actually that, that that's that, that's also a question. Can you have a can you have a um, oh you can just use the UUCP interface is that what okay uh, no, can you have what a... I was wanted to show is that this is the default uh, permissions mm -hmm. of the oh. slash dev tap device and that device uh -huh. has cloning behavior which means if you open it you get a new tap device uh -huh. and so uh, if you just now let's let me check what happens uh, if I open uh, become the UUCP user. Um, and and my question on the tune tap part was if a in if a vm has a tap interface but that tap interface is not you know used anywhere like it's not part of a bridge what what can you gain the networking I mean, I've, I've always added a tap interface to a bridge obviously but um, if it's just it a, a network interface, interface. Uh -huh. So it is it is a network interface if it's brought up on the uh -huh. not in so which uh, Beehive does by default these days uh -huh. and in fourteen will do by default over a file descriptor should work should work uh -huh. always even across uh, VNets potentially uh -huh. uh, because again it's a file descriptor based interface now um, but problem is that um, it is just the host. IP interface, so or Ethernet interface. So if the host puts an address on there uh, and, you, and is configured as router, it will work. And that's, in my opinion, a reasonable production deployment to get rid of a bridge and instead uh, just route on the host. That mm -hmm. makes lots of things cleaner and easier because you don't have shared layer two anymore. So you can have a VM with a tap interface and no need for any bridge interfaces. For example, you could uh, route a slash 65 IPv6 prefix or slash 24 IPv4 prefix to the Beehive uh -huh. uh, host and then just uh, either run a DHCP server or relay on the server or statically assign it or use something else, maybe uh, configure it via link local or something. And would this would, you... would would this look like a would this look like a um what do you call that would this look like a god I forgot his name uh a P two P situation like let's say the Beehive VM's IP address is uh, ten 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 two and the tap zero on the host is ten 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 one and yes. then uh, now they can just ping each other properly it's like an um, yes, it works. Deep, uh, oh. The question okay. is if you want to uh, put there are multiple configurations possible. The cleanest, which should be almost universally supported these days, is to put a slash uh, 31 prefix on the uh, link. But the downside uh -huh. is that you use two addresses per link. Uh, you can also put a host uh, IP on the interface. Uh, okay. inside the guest and then um, just one IP, so basically unnumbered tunnels uh, yes. for the networking for, And then you uh, lose less IPs. One of the downsides in uh, redundant deployments where in a really in a routed network would be that you can black hole route uh, a path if you have an indirect path and the direct path is blocked, but with a VM with only one path, that isn't a problem. Hmm. The problem is that you can't uh, configure this automatically using DHCP, so uh, now you have to adapt every uh, guest to yes. use this, this and either put and put in a interface route as default route because the hmm. def your default gateway now isn't on the uh, link network, 
-hmm. So you have either have to put in a an indirect route, a default route, or a net, an interface route, which yeah, okay. both work. So so, it's, so it's simpler because you can use a link local address uh -huh. as a default gateway, and you have plenty of address space unless you're constrained by an RFC ignorant uh, hoster. You can <laughs> get enough prefix space to just delegate as if you want a slash 64 per virtual machine, which yeah sounds wasteful, but works well. Have we seen anyone focus on routed tap devices in the many nifty beehive management contraptions out there? No, this uh, they all ignore this option. Okay. So last question, I promise. So uh, <laughs> there are so no with, last questions. Uh, with the commit that Jan mentioned, and the fact that we, if if a user, yeah, this one, and the fact that you, if a user does not need um zvol so you know they're using a pretty standard uh truncated virtual file system visual for virtual disk apologies uh so no zvol anything like that and with adding appropriate uh, gr uh groups and stuff like that in 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 freebsd for example maybe we can change the dev taps default for uh uucp dialer maybe maybe we can just tell the users that hey if you are part of the dialer or the uucp group and if you are part of the vmm group uh then congratulations you can have a nat only uh vm um, without what any you can do already is to um change your permissions on the tap device or pre-create them. Uh, it would probably be good to pre-create them and don't destroy them. So um, uh -huh. then basically on boot, they are created and you just reuse the device. The other thing is if you don't put them on a bridge, uh, you really want to use VMNet instead of tap. Um, it's the same driver in FreeBSD, but using it under the VMNet name uh, changes a very important detail for the non-bridge case, and that is the interface does not go link down if it's closed, which means that while it is still a black hole, the routes are not uh, removed. So you only have to set up the route to the uh, guest IP address once, and you don't have to do it every time uh, the tap device is opened again. Huh. So normally, uh, if you use a tap device and it goes uh, and the beehive guests exits, uh, the route to, through the tap device, uh, because it's now down, is removed. And then the next time it's created, uh, unless you do this automatically with, let's say, DevD or some other networking monitoring tool, um, you will now lack that. So. But if you use uh, VMNet, you can just use the existing features in the FreeBSDRC.d scripts, like uh, NetIF, to basically pre-create the devices. And if you assign static renamed devices, you then change the permissions in um, DevFS rules for just these devices. And at least the tap side of it works. I've done that for OpenVPN at a time and stuff like this. But I haven't checked uh, if it's possible to do with Beehive from the VMM side, or if there are additional safety features preventing that. For raw disk files, I don't see any reasons how it, why it even could not work. Uh, but for yeah, for Z vaults, uh, I would have to check, or someone else would have to check better, uh, uh, if permissions are preserved, or if you have to apply the permissions on every Z vault, uh, Z pool import, or whenever. But yeah, these parts, and then you can have uh, there's an other RC.d script which would be relevant in this case, which is called uh, uh, the bridge uh, RC.d script, and then it can automatically um, add interfaces with names uh, matching certain globs to a bridge, so that if you have a TAPD or VMNet device named in a certain way. RC.d uh, scripts would be triggered by DevD 
in response to DevCTL event that the interface has been created or so, up or down or what? So, so you can um, have the uh, I do like your solution operations with this. be done in response to state changes. So I, I do like your solution with this, and obviously it's something that I can implement. But my specific question is, what do we need to change in base to make this available for everyone out of the box? Like, you hey, would have to uh, change the default configuration, and that's okay. all. Or it will changes to the configuration could be done through an RC.d script uh, if it's some kind okay. of management. It's so the things related to networking I've just described are all only configuration changes. Nothing in okay. the code has to change. Okay, that. that's nice. Okay, because um, if, if, really... if, if, if... Okay, sorry. Because if we do achieve this, it means we are closer to a scenario where uh, I want to say normies, also, aka non-operating system developers, uh, can use tools such as Packer uh, in order uh, tools such as Packer on FreeBSD, right? So, for example, Packer uses a backend with Q, Q uh, with Chemu KVM or VirtualBox or whatever mm -hmm. your operating system supports, but it it never worked with a FreeBSD backend properly because of lack of the Beehive support for the user. Like you, you could use Packer technically with Beehive, but you had to be root, which is you know not a common scenario. On, uh, on 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 developer machines, right? Again, um, non-operating um, system developer machines. Uh, so it, it might be <laughs> it might be an easy fix, you know, to be like, hey, uh, if you want to use Packer, change these configurations yep. here and reboot. And congratulations, now you, you can don't even have to Packer reboot. Work. You only have to exactly. apply them by where you're yeah, running and, the RC.t scripts. So. Yeah. Yeah, and now you can use uh, Packer with FreeBSD, you know, so or, or technically Packer with Beehive. So th that might be a good, uh, good um, ecosystem integration. Uh, again, we, we also have to talk with Packer and, and Vagrant and uh, was it called Vagrant? Yes, I think it was called Vagrant yep. and, 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 and ecosystem solutions like that, if they are... Uh, at all interested in supporting FreeBSD, you know, but uh, at least we will have the ability to do that. Realistically speaking, we shouldn't ask the big projects if they care about FreeBSD, but we should find out if there are FreeBSD users who care about these projects yeah. and want to push, uh, try to push changes upon them upstream uh -huh. or maintain uh, them as patches in ports uh, because um, it's quite unlikely that uh, Reagan or Packer asked FreeBSD to please, please, please make this possible for us. That it's probably upon us to make it possible for them. And then here's the code, please take it. <laughs> or well, here's a else. Packer project for VirtualBox. And that might be precisely the point you're making is maybe we could use Beehive. Yeah, so that's the box, of course, huh. of course, and uh, it 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 becomes very interesting also because um, uh, we used to I'm not sure officially or non officially release free BSD images for Packer and Vagrant. I don't. It actually mentioned that. Now. I, I think it just said that, like, hey, oh, we at are the top. at the top. Yeah. Oh, there are official cool. FreeBSD DVM images, blah, 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 blah. These are yeah. Packer specific, I think. These are uh, these like are Packer there. specific or these are not Packer specific? Yeah, the um, release ISOs also include VM images, which are uh -huh. just like lots of zeros in there, pre-compressing yes. 32 gigabyte files if you uncompress them. And Thanks to the Sentinel file, they will also invoke GrowFS on first boot. So uh, on first boot, the um, device you copied it on is larger. It will uh, first resize the partition uh, table mm -hmm. and then uh, the partition and then the file system. Mm -hmm. hmm. yeah. 
so that it is easy to, for example, uh, import a raw file into VirtualBox on Windows to start FreeBSD VM. And hmm. you don't even have to go through the installation. Uh, you just get a ready to run virtual machine. And then you have to busy log in as root with no password on the uh, system console and set a password and enable network access. But yeah. yeah, that's that's that that I think that I think is a pretty pretty nice because uh, I, I I still know a lot of people who use who prefer Packer and Vagrant to things like Docker because they actually need an actual virtual machine and it might be a good place to gain uh, more community support. I mean, b both in the you know bringing more users and also allowing our current users to have support for that. So. I, I, yeah, I think we're pretty much close there. Which brings me to a um, a release engineering question, and uh, Illumos friends can jump in if they have an, uh, a question or even a, an idea about that. Say we've implemented all of these. Say, for example, we've we've improved the defaults, or uh, everything got merged. Does this mean that all of those features will be available in fourteen point one? So now everyone has to wait whatever that time is. Uh, it which sounded like it's in... largely configuration, no? That was Jan's uh, point. The stuff I was talking about, at least the networking side, I can say is possible with no changes to base. You only have to configure the operating system mm -hmm. in that way. Mm -hmm. And about the Beehive end, I don't know uh, if there are additional safety features other than the permissions on the devices which mm -hmm. you can change uh, to make use of them. It could be that certain octals uh, include a dedicated privilege check or something like mm -hmm. that, so that uh, you can open the device, but you can't, let's say, wire down memory or something. So that uh, that remains to be tested. Uh, or read the code for uh, privilege checks. And FreeBSD, all of this happens through one API. Or at least it's supposed to be that way. So What's it would be quite uh, the pref uh, functions. Um, oh. nine pref uh, to check if a thread has a certain privilege. So these are the functions you would uh, look for. Uh, all sides of these functions in the VMM and related code. Anything else on that topic? I sense that with the dust settling after 14's release, we can now discuss back to our regular programming of things like this. Um, and Antrenig, are you in a position or a mood for a run it demo or is that for another day? Uh, as I'm, I have not published the code. I'm sorry about that. Only two people have the repo right now. Um, um, That's okay. I promise, I um, promise tomorrow at the enterprise working group as well as next week for the Beehive call. And uh, as far as I can tell, uh another thing that came to my mind is is this also a problem that needs to be solved on Illumos or their SMF actually rocks and we don't need to care about having stuff like that there? Like I'll let SMF. them answer, but I sure sense they get it right. But uh, <laughs> let's see, Hans, if you're still with us and Andrew, uh do you feel that Beehive is receiving proper process supervision on Illumos and it's it's distros? Um, I haven't felt that it's not, but I haven't put a whole lot of thought into it since you're just kind of putting me on spot here. Boom. Uh, to, to, to put it in a specific question form, uh, our issue on Chemu, sorry, on, on Beehive on FreeBSD was that if it crashes, there's no way to start it properly again. Either, you know, fail it 
or figure out that hey okay this just was a crash or the host requested a reboot and we have to re restart the machine yeah uh, sorry the guest re requested a reboot and we have to start the process again right uh, i was wondering on um, on on illumos does the distributions how how does that go like did, does your smf have proper exit process exit what do you call that process exit handling it's like oh, okay um, we have new stories or or have you noticed anything else run beehive in a zone and if the uh -huh. beehive crashes or reboots or whatever the whole zone will likely reboot i think we made changes once that if you reboot um beehive and it uh, it, it just re-exits so the zone isn't involved but let's assume it, it crashes it's the init process of the zone so uh, the zone will just restart. Oh, that's nice. So like the whole zone will restart. Yeah, that's similar well, to running uh, Beehive in the. Um, what would the happen? Jail, so... Actually, that's... it just would be what happens if you shut down Beehive running in the zone intentionally, whether that is communicated back to the system that it should shut down the zone as well instead of restarting it. Um, I have never tried that, <laughs> but yeah. Now, every day I keep thinking, why don't we just use Illumos? It's, it solves 90% of our problems, you know? <laughs> I'm not so certain on what it does on a VM crash, to be honest, um, because I haven't had that many situations where the VM crashed rather than the guest OS crashed because those are those are really two different, different things when you think yeah. about it. That's a good point. And well, is if that the get, uh, crashes, I mean, the Beehive process continues running, and uh, GuestOS will do whatever it does when it crashes. And if that involves rebooting, then that's what the Beehive process would do. Actually, what we did while I was a giant was um, give um, Beehive, the Illumis Beehive, uh, a way to just re exec itself, or rather, it could have been even the Sony demon that just re exits the init process in that case uh, that it's... because it's... actually I believe that the beehive process exits if the guest reboots there was something about it but it's been a couple of years so I'm done uh, that's the behavior on FreeBSD is that the intention or cause of the exit is encoded into the exit status and it's documented in the main page which uh, exit status uh, corresponds to uh, which cause for the uh, process to exit from reboot to halt to shutdown to uh, triple fault and anything about that is uh, an unexpected bug in Beehive. So really you have to dispatch on the exit code of the Beehive process and then decide what to do with it. And that code does not exist within the Beehive user space process, but it has to be its parent process doing it, as things stand in FreeBSD, which is where the usual process supervision suits like Runit or S6 or other stuff come in. And if you use the base system FreeBSD daemon command, you have to put on your own little shell script in between to dispatch on the exit code because daemon in a base does not support the running a two-phase setup where you have um, one process which runs to completion and then another one getting started in response to inspect its exit state and then decide whether to restart it or not. That is not implemented in daemon because that's basically describing what the already available uh, process supervisors in ports do. Hold that for our demos of Run It and S6RC.
those are exciting and coming and I've posted those exits out of the manual page. So if on Solaris, for example, SMS service supervision uh, supports dispatching based on the exit code, that's all that's required to implement it. That's a quite common feature. I don't know if it's available or if it is supposed to be in some way mapped to a contract, which is a Solaris specific concept. Um, Again, there are lots of ways to skin that cat. Well, on that beautiful note, which does refer to caterpillar tractors and earth movers, not poor felines. Um, anything else, or shall we call it at about an hour? Going once? Seems like a reasonable time to me. Going twice? So thank you, everyone. That was great. I'm glad that we are sort of back on a normal cadence of you know, longer term issues and usability versus the upcoming release. Oh, no, can we fix certain things in time? So I very much thank you all and look forward to talking to many of you in a week. See ya.